Sometimes you want to recreate a building in Revit, but you it's hard to just know where to start, and especially if it's a complicated building. This is the beautiful Center for the Arts at Endicott College, and uh, but it's a complicated building. It's got a lot of different volumes to it, a couple of different kinds of materials, curtain walls, all sorts of good stuff. Where to begin? And I think the one of the handiest things to do is to begin with a floor plan, if you can get one. Uh, and again, sometimes you have an interiors project, you need uh, a plan of a building, you don't have a Revit model, and you want to create it. That uh, evacuation route plan that we're required to have in our buildings is actually really handy, and you can just trace over that. And you can also try converting it to vector lines that are easier to snap to. I happen to have an AutoCAD plan of this building, so I'll start with that. And uh, here I've placed the plan uh, that I, I was able to get uh, into my main floor plan view, uh, place it in between the exterior elevation views. And, and I did use uh, that link feature, the link CAD feature when you insert it, uh, much better in case you, you run into trouble with your AutoCAD plan and you need to make some modifications, you, you can do it. So where to start? Well, what I recommend if you're doing an entire building that you're, you're just trying to recreate, rather than trying to trace this plan with walls and it's a multi-story plan and sometimes there's uh, the walls don't go all the way uh, up to the multi-levels, the best thing I think to do is to actually use masses. Go to the massing and site tab and start there. And you can create masses for the different pieces of the building pretty quickly. Uh, I'm going to just use the in-place mass feature and uh, oh it says you want to save the project. Of course you do want to do that. And like always with Revit you you may want to rename these things uh, just to keep track of them but uh, I, I'm usually way too lazy to do that. I'll just call it mass one and okay. Now in mass drawing mode remember Revit doesn't always like to draw masses. Um, or to visibly display masses. So you do have to be aware that every view that you create a mass, uh, it may not show up. <laughs> so you have to turn it on using the visibility and graphics uh, overrides menu. Now I'm going to start with a, a simple object, a simple shape here. I'm going to draw masses for kind of the different pieces of the building here. There's uh, this uh, architectural studies wing here. There's an atrium. Um, there's an entry to a theater, and then there's a whole classroom wing. But I want to start with something really easy. I'm going to start with a rectangular staircase. And again, when you're creating a model that's of existing conditions, maybe I'm not going to get into the weeds about, say, small storage rooms or vertical chases. I'm just going to create the basic shapes of the building. And this, this is the quickest way to get going. So I'll just draw a rectangle and then select that rectangle and choose create form. And if you remember, there's solids and void forms. I'm, I'm gonna create a solid form. And what does that look like? Let's go to our standard uh, default 3D view and see if we can find out. And here's my volume. And uh, like uh, the any kind of mass, you can select a line, point, or surface and manipulate the model. So there we go, there's my stair tower, sort of. Uh, I'm going to click Finish Mass for now. The next step is to uh, identify and measure out the levels in your project. Now I'm going to take a look at this project from the front view and uh, maybe I'll rename some of these levels here. And if you, to do that, you just click on the name. I'll call this Ground Floor. And remember, it will rename the levels and I'm going to tell it, yes, please do that. Now, uh, level two, I happen to know, because I, I spent a lot of time uh, repelling and measuring. No, actually, I just happen to know that it's 14 feet above level two. Now, there is a, another level above this one. So I'm going to copy this uh, level marker up another 14 feet. That's level three. And then another 14 feet. And that one will get me the roof. Now, why do I even care about these levels? Well, it'll become apparent pretty quickly. First of all, as if you're creating a building, you don't know how big it is and you're kind of uh, judging the heights of objects, it's really nice to use levels because it's you're able to change multiple objects at the same time if you lock them to those levels. Uh, and uh, to do that, uh, I can use the Align tool. 
and I'll align the top of my mass with this roof. Oops, wrong, wrong order, always do that. Align the roof here with the top of the mass, lock them in place, and now if I uh, modify the roof, you see it goes, it goes with it. Now I'm gonna stick with 14 feet. Now I can do this process of uh, creating a mass and making it go to the correct levels for each of these shapes here. Now, I I'm not going to show every single one because obviously you've just learned how to draw a mass. You don't need to, how to learn how to do it again. But the idea is uh, to create separate masses for all the, all the major pieces of your model. So I'll tune back in in a moment when I have done it. See, that wasn't so bad at all. And uh, using the Select Lines tool really helps, uh, and having the AutoCAD plan also really helps. So uh, it, one thing that's definitely true is it's a little hard to see these masses when you look at them kind of in a 3D view. They're, they're all kind of transparent. Uh, a quick way to change that is to go to the Materials menu here on the Manage tab, and uh, let's find that default material uh, I believe it's just called default form. And uh, right now it's it's pretty transparent. Um, you can actually make it zero transparency. I think I've got that the right direction. Oh yeah, there we go. Um, and you could even give it a color if you, if you were so inclined. Here, we'll make it a lovely sepia. Um, and that is just so uh, much faster than trying to create individual walls. Now, uh, one thing we need to do is adjust the height of each of these pieces, and this is where these levels come in so handy. Uh, let me take a look at a couple of these pieces just to show you how you do it. Um, uh, of course, my levels are not visible right now. I need to make this, uh, let's make this wireframe real quick. Um, and uh, you have to know which, which object goes to which roof. Again, using the align tool is very helpful. You can lock each of these roofs into position. That's probably a good idea to make sure I've got the right roof. Yep, I got the right roof. Uh, but each object, again, you can just you can just lock it into position. And not every object is going to have um, the uh, uh, you know an alignment with any of the roof levels I've created. So if you have some unusual ones, obviously either just stretch it or uh, create a new level. Uh, I think most of my roofs align with the levels. And you should note that uh, I can absolutely adjust these objects uh, left and right, uh, top and bottom. And um, if I have to pull the base of an object up, I, I can do so also and just lock it into position. This wing, for example, uh, d doesn't actually start here on the ground. It starts up on the first floor uh, or second floor and, and goes only to the third floor. But I can, I can lock these into position uh, just by dragging, I don't even need to use the um, use the align tool. So just like that, you can see we've we've created pretty much the entire mass of the building. Now, there's a lot of details that are missing, and that we'll add later. Uh, one detail that you can add are things like columns. You can again just do true architectural columns in Revit, or you could just mass some tubes. Um, and depending on how far you want to go, you might want to stretch out your, uh, your planes here so that um, they, they kind of cover the entire area of the building. I think I'm actually just going to measure uh, and build this one wing of the building where we have a roof project that we're going to work on. But before I do that, I want to use a void to cut out the area under side, under the uh, on the bottom floor of this uh, mass right here. To do that, I have to go back in and edit that mass. Um, and now I can I can come in here and I can draw the void shape that represents the uh, entry uh, covered entry area. 
Now it does get a little tricky when you're trying to draw uh, shapes onto these objects when you have all this all this information going. So you know, going to hidden line view or even wireframe sometimes is uh, very important just because otherwise it gets really confusing. And you can see here, I drew what I thought were lines in the correct position, but I've, I've actually drawn them in 3D. So you have to find a view where you can you can create these lines. Uh, plan is almost always better uh, than trying to draw it in 3D. Otherwise, you'll you'll go into a very frustrated state. But that does allow us to use the pick lines feature, uh, at least to get uh, myself started now. Now, even when I'm uh, up here and I've used the pick line feature to draw my my outline, um, when it does that, it often will pick a much longer line than you intended. So you do have to make sure to bring it back until it, it snaps to that line. Uh, see, there's another long one. I can also use this trim extend feature. Just remember to click on the side that you want to remain and it should join those lines. I believe we've got a solid loop here. We do. And uh, now you can create your void form. So switching to 3D view, sometimes it's really hard to see what you've got. So, so do, in fact, go to wireframe mode if you need to. Uh, and, then, and then you'll want to adjust the height of the top of your void form. I believe it actually is slightly below the uh, second level there. So... Um, that should work fine. I'll just go back to uh, solid mode here. Um, the other thing is that the void should cut automatically. If it doesn't, there is the cut geometry tool, um, which is super handy uh, in this sort of situation. So I'll just choose finish mass. Let's see if it cuts, and it does. So I'll add in my columns, and I'm done with the basic outline of the building. And one little trick to be aware of is that uh, you can actually, when you're editing a mass, you know, when you're creating a mass, you can actually insert SketchUp uh, volumes in there. SketchUp geometry works just fine, and it will actually work to uh, create the geometry, uh, the Revit-based geometry, if you stick it inside a mass. Uh, in fact, you can even st stick SketchUp content into families, um, and they, they often work. Again, you can't ed really edit them in Revit, but you can uh, use their content. One thing you might want to think about when you are creating a model of an existing building is using Revit's phasing feature to differentiate between what's existing and what's new. Uh, sometimes you just want to render everything existing as kind of gray, uh, and Revit will be happy to do that. Uh, and sometimes you just need to create a demolition plan. So uh, while we're doing this, let's have a brief discussion on phasing. And first of all, in your model, every view of your model has properties about which phases it shows. These are down at the bottom. And for example, I can have it show me everything, or I can even tell it for me uh, to show me complete, or it can also show me demolition and new stuff, or just demolition and what's existing. So really pretty powerful filters here, because if you create a new project inside an existing building, it will automatically create demolition plans if you follow the rules of how to demolish things in Revit. Uh, I'm gonna choose show complete so that it doesn't look any different than it is. Uh, and this is great if you plan to render. Showing complete will fix any render problems. Otherwise, when you change the phasing, uh, it will it will look uh, gray, anything in the previous filter. Now, the other thing is I can change this phase to only show me existing. And when I hit apply, everything disappears. And the reason is all that stuff I created is in the new construction phase. So this current view, if I say, oh, show me everything that's new, it will, um, I have to change that so that it will do it. Now, I'm going to select everything, uh, filter it, so I just have the masses, and hit OK. And uh, I can make all of these masses existing construction. And again, the advantage is that if you don't want to show existing construction, you can hide it uh, quite easily by differentiating. Also, uh, walls, uh, doors, all the things that you create in Revit, every single one is going to have its own filter. Usually, that filter is taken from the uh, phase of your drawing. So if you draw in a drawing, 
that's the existing construction phase, you'll find that every object you create will also be on that existing construction phase. And this allows someone like, say, an intern to come and draw an existing model while someone else, perhaps the project manager, is working on the new project design. To illustrate the concept of phasing, I, I made four different views. They're actually the same view, the default 3D view, uh, with four different phase settings. So first of all, uh, there's the existing one, which only shows what's existing. There's the demolition plan, which only shows things which are existing, either things that are going to not be demolished or things that are going to be demolished. And you can see here, things that are going to be demolished are red. Then uh, I have a new construction plan. And what that plan does is it differentiates what's existing. See how everything existing is kind of gray, uh, the walls and whatnot. And then anything new shows the actual material on that wall. Uh, finally, there is the show complete view, which shows everything with its uh, materials. Uh, there's no uh, filter overrides or anything like that. So how do you actually draw in these views? Well, for example, if I was in the existing conditions view, and let's say I wanted to put in something new, the current phase of this drawing down here at the bottom of the view properties is existing. So anything I draw will go onto that phase. Also, the phase filter is set to show all. So nothing will be hidden. Every object that I draw that's existing will show up. So if I come in here and uh, I'll just click on component and, and I'll add a, add a desk or something like that. Um, there you go, it shows up normally. You'll also see that it shows up here in the demolition plan, but that it is not red, it's actually gray. And that's because it's existing, but it's not getting demolished. It also shows up in the new construction plan, but you see how it's also gray. This is because in the new construction plan, you always differentiate between what's existing and what's new. Finally, in the show complete plan, this is uh, the setting which we usually use for rendering, the desk shows up correctly. It shows up with its full beauty uh, and color. These are just the default components. Now, if I select this object and I come over here and I change the phase that it's demolished, see how there's two settings, one for phase created, one for phase demolished. It isn't demolished. If I go and say, oh, in the new construction plan, I'm gonna demolish this plan. Now, when I deselect that object, you should see it looks normal in the existing plan because nothing's happened yet. But in the demolition plan, it is red. It indicates that there's going to be, um, this is going to be removed. And then you'll see here in the new construction plan, it's gone. It's magically gone. And also in the show complete plan. And this works for objects you place, uh, but you can also, uh, like uh, components, but it, you can also use windows. So for example, I'll just take a window, we'll paint a nice big window in this back wall. If I come and place that plan in the existing conditions plan, I'll just place it down here, it shows up in all the plans as mentioned before. However, if I want to make a new window, you should Remember, whenever you want to add anything new, you should be in the new construction plan. Now, when I place a window in this wall, what happens is it shows up fully colored in this view. So it, it indicates that it's new, but interestingly enough, here in the demolition plan, there's now a red area indicating this, you need to cut a hole in the outside wall. And I can move this window up and down, left and right, and the demolition indication changes with it. You'll also notice there is no change to the existing plan. So once again, everything must be considered as to what phase it's created and what phase it is demolished, if it is indeed demolished. And here I can change the phase filter of this window. I can make it existing and like magic, all views will change in a corresponding manner. So that's how you can create existing conditions, demolition, uh, new construction, and finally rendering floor plans. And you might be wondering, how do I control what all these things look like in these different views? For example, the new construction plan, it is 
um, uh, showing what's new as uh, different than what's existing. Well, first of all, the filter of the new construction plan is show previous plus new. And what that means, previous means anything from the previous uh, phase that has not been demolished. The demolition plan is very similar. The phase filter here is show previous, anything that's existing that, or from the previous filter that has not been demolished. But in this case, it shows it as uh, a demo, anything that's been demoed. Finally, the show complete plan, cleverly, that it labeled it show complete because it uses the show complete filter. Now, what does all this mean? Well, if you go to the manage tab here, you'll find the phases menu. And this is where all this stuff gets defined. And in fact, you'll see there's only two phases in this particular project. Um, but some projects, complex projects like, I don't know, library renovations, might have multiple phases, many, many phases. Uh, you know, relocating objects, salvaging objects, partial demolition, partial construction, that kind of thing. Anyway, the phase filters that we are using, the show complete, show demo and new, uh, show previous and demo, and show previous and new. Each of these are defined here in this phase filter library here, and each one either shows the objects that are in that category. So for example, right now we only have um, new objects, existing objects, and demolished objects. And I guess they're technically are temporary objects. So in show complete, it shows everything new by category, which means if it's a wall and it's painted, it shows up normally. Same with existing, it shows up normally. And then anything demolished is not displayed at all. So show complete shows everything with its normal materials that is not getting demolished. Showing demo and new, you can imagine, it shows um, anything new as normal, but anything demolished, they, we override the way that the objects look. Any object at all will be overridden. So typically you make those red and you make those heavy dashed lines. Same with the um, previous and new and previous and demo. Each of these you can override what's existing so that it looks gray. And this is fairly typical. You can also control it so that anything existing has say a black poche in it. Um, very typical. Um, for uh, construction drawing types of plans. Finally, the graphic overrides, these are what, uh, is the, what is referred to here. When you override a category, it shows up over here. So for example, the demolished uh, materials, I can say, oh, you know, the uh, objects that you see uh, that are demolished, like that window, if I override it and say, you know what, I want that to be um, red, because like red for overrides, and maybe I'll give it some kind of pattern. Um, I'll just make it solid and okay. I can also make the cut lines red, and I can make them really dark, say six. That's probably a bit much. Um, and then cut patterns, I could also make them um, red, for example. But maybe I'll make it um, uh, red, I'll make it a lighter red might be a little bit too much on my plans. Okay, so if I click OK, I'm now going to change the overrides here um, so that the demo plan looks different. Same with the existing conditions plan. If I, uh, when I show existing materials, maybe I don't want the lines to be gray. That seems a little, a little light to me. I'll make them black and I'll make them have a heavier line weight. So I do want to see the existing uh, walls when they're cut, but I just, I just don't want them to be quite so light. So now when I click OK, what you should see is that anything that is demolished, oh here, I'll change this back to, uh, to demolished, to make it new construction, and then you should see the demo area. Now my view of what these look like should be entirely different. For example, uh, the solid red here, I guess it was kind of solid red before, uh, but uh, things like the line weights on these existing walls are much darker now. I could also override things like the fill patterns uh, and whatnot. 
Okay, so how do we add walls to this project? Revit walls. Well, we know how to do that, right? You go to the wall tool. However, within the Revit wall tool, there is the wall by face option. And uh, you can see from the video, this will create walls based on the faces of your model. So I'll choose this option. And you'll see as I mouse over different walls, I'll get a nice little preview of which face. It even does curved faces, faceted faces. This is such a great feature. Now, let's talk about complex walls. Uh, our project here is quite a complicated building, so we are going to want to create our own wall type. So if you go to edit type, you'll see here that it's just a generic basic wall here. I'm going to duplicate this and I'm going to call it, you know, existing visual and performing art center walls. Okay, and I can now edit the structure of this building and I'll go to the preview menu and I can I can really start to tweak all the layers of the building. For example, I can make the structural layer, I can make it a foot if I wanted to. Um, I can also add layers to the inside and the outside. If you choose insert here, it will add a layer and you can move it up or down. So for example, the core layer, I could add vapor barriers, I could add exterior sheathing, I can add all sorts of great stuff. And each of these, I can define its function. So for example, I could have the interior layer here be, um, say, an uh, interior drywall. So, and again, I could just come in and I could, I could actually define these materials. I could create materials for the interior uh, of the building and the exterior. And I think, I think I'll do that. When I create these new materials, I, I do like to use an underscore or my initials to um, uh, create a name that shows up very quickly when I search for it. I usually use the uh, render appearance here. Um, and then I'll choose a material I think I actually have an image that I can use for this particular material. Uh, and this, uh, these panels are, I think, just a cast stone material. So I just, I just have an, an image that I, I cropped. And remember, you can define the dimensions or you can lock them to the original proportions. Um, and of course, if you have any other uh, transformations that'll, that'll link it back to the original. Uh, but this is a great way you can, you know, you, you can kind of begin by using walls that have all the, the bits and pieces of your project uh, kind of ready-made. Now, one other thing that is handy is uh, having a surface pattern that helps me to lay out the windows on the project. Um, this particular building has, a, a, I think, a five foot by two foot module and uh, but not all the windows follow that modules and but it will help me as i'm trying to place them to have a pattern on the walls uh, and i can do that in shaded mode um, and uh, what i can do here is the surface pattern i can change it to be some custom pattern just use a model pattern and that way it will show up in all views a drafting pattern just shows up in, in your current view and uh, I don't really see one here that's going to be my size. So I'm going to make a new fill pattern. And uh, really, it, it's quite easy. Uh, you just uh, set the uh, pattern feature to the angle that you want, which in my case is zero. And uh, the line spacing uh, is going to be two feet by five feet. Or actually, I think it might be five feet by two feet. I, I always get these wrong. And of course, then you you have to go back and change them, but that's just, just the way it is. It's too bad they don't make a bigger preview. Let's see if we can get a bigger preview here. I'm thinking, uh, I'm thinking I didn't get this the right direction. Just keep making this bigger until we see a horizontal line, but apparently we don't. So uh, let's try making this two feet by five feet and see if anything looks different. Oh yeah, there we go. Now we can see that it's a horizontal pattern. You don't have to do this, but uh, just be aware you can use these default patterns or a custom pattern to help you lay out a building where you don't quite know what it's what exactly it's going to be. Yet. Now I know the dimensions of this, but but you may not. So I'll hit apply and OK, and make sure that you have the outside of the building on the exterior side and the interior building on the interior side, and that everything has some kind of dimension. Uh, and in fact, you can even see this in kind of section view. 
uh, and we've, we've done this before, you can add in things like string courses, crown moldings, uh, uh, all sorts of elements, uh, wall base on the interior. Uh, and you can see here I've, I've given the interior a green color and the outside a brown color. So now I've got this terrific uh, wall that I can use for my exterior. Hit apply and OK. And here we are finally able to click on a wall and place the material on that wall. You see here, it's, it's pretty easy. You just click on the wall and all of a sudden you've got all these walls that are the correct height and they are um, in the correct position. And what they do is they go, uh, you can choose which face of the mass that they're going to go on. I have chosen the finished face exterior because I traced a plan uh, all the way to the exterior of the wall. Uh, but anyway, you can, you can make your way around the building. I am actually not going to do the whole building, uh, partly because that might take a long time, uh, but also I, I'm really actually only interested in this uh, roof area, so we don't, we don't need to create every corner of the entire building. And uh, what's also cool is I can, I can do this same procedure with my uh, SketchUp, imported SketchUp model. It will recognize these faces. Of course, that's kind of a strange thing to do. Uh, with my SketchUp model. Uh, there are other things that you can create with your massing, uh, including roofs. If you go to the roof tool, and again, do roof by face, what you'll find, you can choose an existing roof type. Um, maybe we'll go with a generic 18 inch roof because I think it's a pretty thick roof. Um, you just have to remember which face it's going on. I'm trying to remember if it goes up or down when I place this. Uh, we'll find out pretty quickly. I guess it went, uh, oh, it hasn't gone yet. Um, you have to click create roof uh, or select the roof that you want and then create the roof. Uh, and I believe, yes, it went down, so that's okay. Um, uh, on the other hand, you can uh, have it have an offset. So like I created this roof uh, and actually now that I look at the picture of the roof, I, I think it's it's actually quite a thin uh, drip edge, and in this case, I'm, I'm not too concerned with the roof construction, so I think I'm just going to make this um, some really thin roof so I get my, easily get my, um, my drip edge. We'll just call this existing roof, and we'll just make it, I, I think it's probably about four inches, and okay, and apply, and okay, and now uh, that we've got the right height here, we can make the uh, offset height four inches. And there we go. So now when I create a new roof by footprint, uh, roof by face, um, I'll choose my uh, existing roof type and uh, we'll give it a four inch offset so that it, it gives us a nice little drip edge up top. Hopefully it will do that. Uh, create the roof and we'll do this guy here, this little piece over here. So there you go. You can see you, you've quickly got uh, a lot of the building cooking without a whole lot of effort. And of course, once again, every type of roof I could go and I could dig in and develop the full construction. But for our project, we're, we're outside of the building, so we, we don't really actually care what the roof is made out of. I mean, I do care, but uh, I don't care that much. And uh, don't forget that we can create roofs uh, just like we did with the floors and the walls uh, using our SketchUp model. Um, and again, SketchUp just a little bit more flexible for massing tools, but um, this will create Revit native roof objects. Uh, I'll just choose the create roof feature. And uh, now I've got, uh, I've got roofs that are, you know, kind of Revit based. They have a construction type and uh, they can be modified using kind of the usual uh, Revit grips. Um, so quick, a quick way, again, sometimes it's just like Re uh, SketchUp is really quick for dormers. Revit, not so quick for dormers. So this, uh, take advantage of using multiple programs. Now, creating floors is a little different uh, in that you have to tell Revit which floors you want floors on first, which levels. And uh, so select all your masses, and you'll see up here... Uh, on the modify toolbar, the mass floors button. So if you click on that, it'll say, oh, well, you've got a bunch of levels in your project. Which ones do you want me to divide up your masses? And I'll click OK. 
And what you'll see is now each floor has this kind of divider on it. Um, and then once you have the divider, you can go to the uh, architecture ribbon and uh, go to the floor tool, but floor by face. And then you'll see it selects the floor that uh, you have created using your floor uh, tool. And again, it's a great time saver. Uh, obviously, yeah, I could do the entire model. I only really want it in this uh, main area here and in the atrium. So I think I'll, I'll stick with that. And hopefully when we cut a section of this model, we should see some floors coming through nicely. So we'll go to view, section, and uh, we'll just cut a section right through this part of the building, go to the view, and I don't see any floors. Ha, I always forget to do that. Uh, when, I, when I have the, uh, the floor plates selected, I do have to click the Create Floor button. And of course, I'm using a generic 12-inch floor. Use a floor that makes sense for your building. Now you should see your floor plates show up. And in fact, there they are. And they're not perfect. Obviously, you don't really want to see them on the outside of the building. Uh, and I have hidden my wall and uh, roof layer here. When I turn them back on, you, you will see this overlap. So you, you do have to kind of come in here and uh, edit each of these floor plates. Uh, I guess a floor plan view is probably best. See how they're, they're overlapping my exterior wall. So you'll want to drag them in to uh, make sure that they, they sit inside the uh, exterior wall. Uh, and that's the same for this guy here, wherever the floor is, if I could select it. Also, one thing Revit does not do when you make new levels is create a view of those floor plans. So you do have to go to the view menu and there's a whole plan view uh, area that you can add new plans uh, or you can create plans for levels you, you haven't created plans for yet. Or you can, you can select levels that you just created and make new floor plans. Um, there's this do not duplicate existing views. Sometimes you do want to duplicate existing views. But uh, so here we are up on the roof. And uh, if I go down to my project browser, I can go to the main floor plan. And you can see that I, I have a level three now and uh, I, can, I can come in here and the, 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 the floor plate should be visible. And don't forget, every view that you have of your project has phase filters. So make sure that on this phase filter, first of all, that you're showing complete and that will change the way the graphics look, usually a little bit. Uh, but then also it will allow you to, um, in the 3D views, if you have created any new objects, for example, this floor that I created, I can select it. You will want to make sure that it was created in the existing phase if it's an existing object. And again, I'll edit the edge of this floor like I did before and um, uh, bring it in so it doesn't show up on the outside of the building. So the time has come to start uh, adding some detail to this outside of the building. And first of all, in this particular building, I, I drew this as one giant wall. But in fact, in reality, inside this building, the, there is no uh, wall here behind this uh, second story classroom wing. So we would need to make this wall an L shape. Well, that's actually pretty easy. You can choose the Edit Profile button. And what you'll see is a purple line that indicates the profile of this building. And you can see it actually is kind of an, an uh, well, I guess not an L, maybe a P shape. Um, what I can do, I'm going to go to the front view so that I don't accidentally move something in three dimensions. And I can move the boundary of this wall. That's what the purple line is. And I'll just drag it up to the second level. And it's going to say, hey, I, I, I'm constrained because I was created using that mass. Can I remove that constraints? And, and yes, you can remove the constraints. And you can see here that this wall is now going to be L-shaped, that there's no overlap. If I looked from the inside of the building, I wouldn't, wouldn't see a wall. Now, the wall actually has glass. It has, I believe, two courses of masonry at the top and two courses of masonry at the bottom. But uh, then it's, it's actually glass. So 
how do we make that glass? Well, we could try to configure some kind of window, but again, it's an L-shaped wall and an L-shaped curtain wall. So let's use this wall that we've created to help us uh, make that. I'm gonna actually copy this wall. So I'm gonna go into a view from above and I'll use the copy feature. I'll copy a new wall straight down to the bottom. And, it, and it's gonna say, oh, you know, there's, there's a door that you had that, um, that was in that wall uh, from my previous demonstration. Um, do you, do you, what do you wanna do with that? And I basically wanna get rid of it. So this wall, uh, is, uh, you, as you can see, an L-shaped wall like we made before. Um, and I could um, try to add in windows, again, based on the pattern that I have added to the exterior wall. That's why the pattern is so handy. However, I'm going to turn this wall into a special wall type called a curtain wall. And if we go down in the wall types menu, uh, by default, there are three different curtain wall systems. Um, there's the curtain wall one, which is basically a blank wall um, with no uh, horizontal or vertical subdivisions. There's uh, exterior glazing, which does have subdivisions based on a pattern, um, but uh, can be manipulated and you can add different kinds of mullions. Finally, the storefront system is kind of a ready-made system. It's got uh, subdivisions and mullions already made. This is a great system for when you kind of have a regular window you're trying to recreate. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose that system. And you'll see here, when I do that, like magic, uh, every uh, element of this curtain wall is created for us. Uh, this includes horizontal and vertical mullions and also um, uh, the glass and the subdivisions in the glass. And the way curtain walls work is that uh, each subdivision, and uh, these are called curtain grids, each curtain grid can receive a mullion. And so in order to add a mullion, you have to add a grid first. Now it would be quite tedious and repetitive to add in a grid manually, and that's what this uh, storefront system is all about. It has a grid already created for you. So I'm going to create a custom one for our project. So choose edit type, and duplicate the original storefront system. And I'll call it uh, curtain wall existing. And in this new curtain wall existing system, I'm gonna change the spacing so that it matches what's existing. I believe it's the horizontal grid is two feet. And I'll hit apply and uh, let's close out of this menu so we can see what it looks like. And there you go. That looks quite similar to what we have. And there are some subtleties. For example, like I said, there are two courses at the top and bottom that are in fact just um, uh, masonry. So when you overlay this, you can see that the top and bottom will have some masonry. I can edit the profile of this wall, even though it's a curtain wall, I can still edit the profile. Uh, just go back here to modify and choose edit profile and I can drag the top down. And what's convenient is, now let me remove those constraints. Um, when you do this, I have the grid visible here because I've created it um, so that I can quickly snap to the top and bottom. And you know, this one's off a little bit too. So I'm gonna drag that over. There, there probably should be some kind of joint in there. Um, and same here, there's actually probably a little bit of a foot at that existing wall. Um, I could drag that up and, and that gets a little tweaky. Again, we're trying to create an existing building. Uh, in general, you don't want to get too much into the weeds right away. But anyway, when I click the checkbox, you should see that I now have a much smaller curtain wall. Um, and sometimes it looks like my horizontal grid may have disappeared here a little bit. Um, let's check the settings, other settings in this menu and see if we can figure out what happened to that grid. Um, and probably, it is not adjusting for the mullion size. Let's, let's change that and see if it makes my grid show up. Hit apply, and there you go. The grid should show up correctly. Sometimes when you modify these uh, parameters, they, uh, they kind of screw things up a little bit. Anyway, uh, finally, the other thing you can change is the way that the mullions are um, interacting with each other. So for example, um, the way that the grid is uh, 
uh, breaks with the other pieces. This is kind of how it all snaps together. Um, so for example, we could have the vert vertical grid and the border continuous. And what you should see is the border joins become uh, solid. And um, you can also change some of the other settings. For example, the size of the different kinds of mullions. Uh, in this case, the uh, vertical mullions, the borders, we can change those to be some different uh, material or different uh, dimension. Um, for example, we can make uh, corner mul uh, make these an L-shaped corner mullion or just a rectangular mullion. Um, let's see, quad corner. Let's go with this one and apply. And uh, it will it will give us uh, a message saying, you know, hey, I just changed some mullion. And there you go. You can see that the mullion has changed. And uh, depending on what you change, you'll see uh, different different arrangements. In this case, I think there's a structural piece in there. Uh, the horizontal mullion is the same way. We can change the border to be that same uh, five by five and apply. And uh, you should see that it, it will swap out these pieces. That, that does look a little bit large, but um, I think it's, it's probably okay. And so I'll make all of these the five by five. Apply. And again, whatever settings you had for the rest of your curtain wall should uh, apply correctly. So how do we get this wall to connect to this wall as if it was a window? Well, it's actually, Revit is prepared to do that for you. It has a special feature. It's under the properties of the curtain wall. You choose edit type. And what you'll see, there's a button. It's usually checked by default with the storefront system called automatically embed. And what this means is it, it says, I'm going to treat this curtain wall as if it was a window, as if it's something that could be inserted. Now, it's a little hard to drag it exactly in this view. So I'm actually going to switch to the third floor plan view. Uh, just you don't want to get the wall going a little too far left or right. It, it can kind of wreak havoc. Uh, and I'm just going to choose the move tool so I can get it very exactly. And now you can see as I come up to this wall, that horizontal heavy blue line, that indicates, yes, indeed, I'm going to be aligning with that wall. Just click to place the curtain wall. And, it, and there are some doors in there that it's going to delete because those don't make any sense. But now you should see that you have a nice curtain wall on the outside of the building. That wasn't too hard, you know, was it? What's nice too is I have this curtain wall type. I could use it for other walls. Say this, uh, there's windows here and here and windows here. Uh, I don't need to recreate all of those for this particular project, but uh, this is a fairly successful and easy way to do it. Doors pose a particular problem with curtain walls. And the reason is if you go and you try to put a door in a, just a freestanding curtain wall, which I drew here, we get the I can't do that button uh, or indicator. And um, what this Revit only allows certain types of panels in these walls. So each of these uh, curtain grids divides up the curtain wall and you end up with a panel. So uh, if I go and I try to select them, what you'll see, I've, I've got line here for the glass and for these mullions and these uh, uh, vertical lines, which are the divisions. If I filter my selection, I can filter it down so that it's just panels and apply and OK. Uh, first of all, each panel is locked, uh, pinned, so you can't make changes to it even if you wanted to. If you unpin it, you'll see that there are some options. For example, I could just have an empty panel and now it's just showing me the bottom of the, the bottom mullion, okay? Uh, but I could also load in a door from the Autodesk library. And here I am in the Autodesk library and you'll see that as usual, there's a bunch of lovely, lovely doors. Um, but unfortunately, only some will work in the curtain wall. Now, in this case, uh, I think we only have enough space for a single door, so let's let's go with that one and uh, just load it into your project. And uh, it will ask you for a size, which kind of makes sense. You'll probably want to think through how big your, your grid is. I believe we have a two-foot grid, so we'll want to choose something that is uh, based on that grid plus maybe two inches for the uh, frame. Click OK. Uh, and now when we select the panel, and by the way, I selected it before by using the uh, the selection window, which I find to be the fastest. You can also leave your mouse over the panel and hit tab 
and see how sometimes, if you're lucky, you get the right panel. Not always. I, I always seem to be uh, too zoomed out or zoomed in. Anyway, uh, now you should see in your uh, menu, you should see any of the doors that you loaded in. Here's my curtain wall, uh, single glass, select that one, and you should see the uh, door frame show up per, per normal. Now I would have to also uh, go and select other panels in that exterior wall and um, and make sure that the door is the correct height, which I, I don't think it is because I, I have horizontal mullions every two feet. So I'd have to delete all those extra mullions. But uh, one nice thing about using the trick that we did of placing this curtain wall inside an existing exterior wall is that we can use regular doors. They actually work um, in this um, system. The, the only thing is the mullions, you can see they look a little funky. So um, you are going to have to try to work out exactly uh, how, they're, how they're looking um, here uh, be, because you can see it, it's, quite, it's quite silly looking. Uh, definitely not realistic. Uh, probably you're going to be doing some detail line manipulation when you get to a higher level of detail at this coarse scale, uh, it's probably okay. Um, I suspect uh, with this angled piece that we are using in our curtain wall, perhaps an angled uh, corner bracket. So maybe if we went to a square uh, angle bracket on the corners, we'd, we'd get a better look. But I think for our purposes, it looks fine at a large scale. And especially, we're, we aren't doing construction drawings right now. We're, we're basically just trying to get the existing building modeled. Um, very frequently in construction drawings, you'll have a lot of detail lines covering up some things that are, are either too uh, difficult to draw um, in their full detail within the systems available, um, or things that just uh, don't line up correctly. For example, this corner mullion, I may have to shorten this wall or adjust the size of it, depending on whether or not there's any piece of exterior wall right there. There's a lot of little tweaks that you would have to do. Anyway, to uh, get the other curtain walls, by all means, you just do the same process that we just did. You select uh, select the uh, wall that you want to cop uh, that you want to add the curtain wall to. Um, copy it off, change it to a storefront, and then uh, s uh, adjust the profile and bring it back in. And like magic, you'll have yourself pretty quickly a fairly complex uh, exterior building mass. Now, one last thing that you can do is you can create a custom curtain mullion. Now, I'm not going to get too deep into the weeds of creating custom families here, but uh, we are going to just take an existing family and adapt it. Now, you might say, how, how do you do that? There didn't seem to be an option for create a new one. You have to go into your project browser down to where it says families, and you'll see here it says curtain wall mullions. And then in there you have rectangular, quad, L corner, all the ones that we saw available. These are what are loaded into your project and they're all the, the standard ones. Um, and of course we can, uh, I think we were using the 2.5 inch by five inch rectangular one. Well, one thing you can do is you can get the type properties by just right clicking on it. Now, and Revit does, for whatever reason, make it quite difficult to manipulate some of these standard items. And uh, so this is actually the easiest way. And I'm going to duplicate this. And um, I want to make, there's fins on the outside of this building here. Uh, so I'm going to make this actually a, a lot wider. I'll make this 12 inch rectangular, uh, and I'll just call it fins. All right. And uh, like with most Revit families, renaming it does not change the dimensions. So you have to come in and manipulate those separately. And uh, you can edit the dimension here, it's the thickness. And again, I'm just going with a standard object here. We could absolutely uh, change all of these in, in a more aggressive form by redrawing new profiles, but that actually gets quite complicated. Anyway, we can also change the offset so that it uh, goes to the outside of the building uh, rather than in the middle of these objects. Uh, I believe six inches should get us over in the right direction. Uh, finally, this is where you change the material. So we can make it whatever material we want, but let's keep it at uh, this material and uh, hit apply. And uh, by the way, you can preview what this looks like. Of course, the preview is probably going to be something very rectangular. I don't even see it in here. So let's click OK. 
And uh, now let's take this exterior curtain wall. And again, it's uh, you have to make sure that you're selecting the curtain wall and not the uh, exterior wall. Um, and then uh, let's go and like we did before, edit type, but I'm going to duplicate this one because I don't want them all to have um, and uh, all to have fins. I just want this one to have fins. So I'll click OK. And what you'll find is that my horizontal mullions here, uh, when I go and I choose the interior type of mullion, I should have my rectangular custom fin available. And let's hit apply. We should see some fins sticking out, hopefully. And don't they look lovely? And uh, But uh, also, uh, we want them not to break in the middle, so we can change the border and grid condition, the join condition. Let's make the horizontal grid continuous. And you can see pretty quickly, you can generate uh, a kind of custom element. Again, not super custom. I, these aren't oval-shaped, uh, you know, ailerons on the exterior of the building. But uh, real simple objects you can create quite, quite quickly. Um, for the exterior of your building. And uh, once I adjust some of the endpoints of these walls to uh, get rid of the corner, uh, you can see that it looks pretty, pretty uh, close to what we have in the building. Now we have already modified our existing wall types uh, to create uh, this custom pattern, but one other thing you can do is create sweeps in your wall type. This wing of the building has a stone down at the bottom rather than this coarse masonry. We can change that in our wall type. And uh, what you do, you select the walls that uh, need to change and edit them. And, and let's duplicate these guys so they're unique, so we don't change all the walls. And uh, like we did before, we put this uh, view of the wall into section view and we go to edit structure. So now we can actually kind of edit the bits and pieces of this wall. And uh, this is actually, I mentioned before, where you put in things like sweeps for walls and bases, but you can actually split the face of either the inner side or the outer side of your wall. Um, there's a split region tool. And you can come, and just like the uh, split face tool and when you're drawing in the main model, you can click on a position. Um, and that position is editable. You can come in and uh, actually select the line, and that will give you access to the height of this uh, split face. I believe 10 feet is how high ours is. And then finally, we can create a custom material to go in this new split face. Uh, let's come back here. I'm going to insert a new finished layer with a masonry material applied. So uh, with this uh, new finished layer, I just select the layer and I can assign it by clicking the Assign Layers tool to whichever area in my section I think it belongs. So I'll click over here. You see I can highlight this uh, layer. Come on in there. Uh, and now it is the new material. And uh, you can apply reveals uh, to that area separately to push it back. You can adjust all these details, but uh, this is a quick way to get that foundation to look correct. And I'll just put it into realistic view here for a moment so you can see uh, what that looks like. Again, we're not looking for perfection here in this existing building. We're just trying to get it to uh, kind of get the general gist of um, what the building is like. So one other thing that you can do to create a complex existing building is to recreate stairs. Now this building, it provides a handy dandy, very complicated stair that we can uh, use to uh, show some basic features. And the big thing with stairs, we know, we know how to create stairs, right? Just go to the architecture tool and stair. Uh, and normally you can do uh, the stair by run Obviously, we'd want to measure the width of the stair and get it exactly right and make sure that you're telling it the uh, correct distance that it's going, ground floor up to level two. And you can uh, begin like you normally do, uh, setting the width of the stair. I'm going to go with a run. Uh, I think four foot two is the width. And uh, so we, we might want to set this width. This looks a little narrow to me. Oh, actually, it's five foot two. That's what it should be. 
Okay, so let's start. We'll draw a run of stairs. Like normally, when you draw stairs, it tells you how many you have to go. Um, now, here is the trick. When you have a complex stair, you're going to want to use more than one tool to draw it. In this case, I can create a sketch to draw the second run of stairs. Just click on the sketch tool, um, and you can draw the boundaries. I'll just draw them using uh, the arc tool. Now, it does seem to make a difference when you're drawing this boundary. Uh, I, it would be nice to use this pick line feature and just click on a line and have it uh, draw that for me. Um, but it does seem like it's uh, direction specific, which is to say you want to start your arc where the start of the run is going to be. Um, I don't know, it must be a rabbit rule that uh, forces you to do that. I think you can pick the treads, see how it is counting down as I go along. And with any luck, that will create a stair that works, Oh, except this one doesn't. I uh, believe sometimes it, it is a little picky about having the ends of these lines go a little bit past the treads. And it may be because my uh, riser lines are not quite as long as these treads. So maybe, maybe I'm missing one of these somewhere, but let's click OK. And there you go. You see the order of the stair is correct. So I've got my two runs of stairs, a standard one and a custom one. I can also draw in a landing. And Revit just, it's, it's not going to figure out this landing automatically. And on this one, you will want to figure out how, uh, where the landing goes. If you select the first run here, you'll see that it finishes at 11 feet 1 inch. Um, and that's where our landing wants to be. So when I click on the landing tool, I can tell it um, uh, how high I want the landing to be. Uh, I just go draw in the outline here. Oops. And you can use any number of tools, the line or the pick line tool. It just has to be a continuous boundary. That's, that's the only rule. And I'm pretty lazy. I prefer to use the pick line tool and then trim it all up uh, to make an even boundary. Oh, and uh, like I said, don't forget to make this the correct height or else it's going to look a little funny. 11 foot 1 is the relative height. That's the, the top of that first run of stairs. So I should be able to click Finish Edit Mode uh, if I have a continuous loop. And then I can click the Finish Stair Mode. And like magic, I should have a full stair. It may give me some errors with the rails because of the peculiar landing. And you can see the stair does, in fact, look pretty good. Uh, we have to uh, make it go up to the multi-story, the upper level uh, of this building. Um, you can actually just do this by choosing Select Levels when you're editing the stair. And you see how my levels are uh, grayed out, the ones that it automatically goes to. If I select the third level and uh, choose the checkbox, it will make a whole second story of my stairs. So absolutely make those stairs be multi-level stairs. That'll save you some time. Finally, use the uh, special feature, the shaft opening feature. I could edit each of these floors individually, but uh, drawing a shaft opening, this allows me to match the exact condition of my stair. And uh, maybe this is easiest to draw in floor plan. Again, you'd want to make sure the shaft is going in the correct direction. But of course, you go to your floor plan and you, you can't see anything. I'm up here on the third floor. And uh, even if I make it wireframe, I can see the stair that I've created, but I can't see my original floor plan that's way below. The way that you change that, uh, let me X out of the uh, shaft drawing mode. And uh, yes, I do want to discard the cut. Uh, and what I can do is I can actually change the view range here of my project. Oh, I scrolled right past it. Uh, the view range allows you to choose how far you can see in your project. Right now, it's just kind of showing me uh, immediately below. But if I choose this unlimited option and apply, I should be able to see all the way down in my project. And I'll just click OK, go back to wireframe mode, and now I can see all the way down in my project. So let's go back to uh, making our shaft. This whole area is open. However, there is a landing on the second floor, so I can uh, accommodate my uh, opening for that shape.
And like I did before, I used my pick lines tool. You can also pick walls, interestingly enough, uh, to get the right shape. You also want to make sure that the uh, shaft goes down as low as the first floor. Um, we don't actually want to cut through the floor, so let's make this uh, one foot above the first floor. We also do want it to go all the way up to the top level. I can choose roof if I want, and then make the top offset minus uh, 11 or uh, minus one foot, and uh, that will cut through anything including ceilings. Uh, again, you might want to think about exactly how far it's going to go. Actually, now that I think of it, maybe I'll just go up to level three and make it one foot above level three. Then that should uh, cut through all of my floors. And you can see here that it does, in fact, cut through all of my floors, and it leaves that landing configured uh, the way that it is in the project. So the last really complex Revit element is a railing. Now, railings are like curtain walls. They have a lot of bits and pieces, and they have kind of nested families and components. Now, starting a railing is simple enough. You just choose railing, and you sketch the lines. And like we did before, you can either use the pick line feature uh, like this, um, or you can uh, use the uh, draw freehand tool. Either one works. And of course you want to choose the family type and uh, whether or not it's a guardrail or a handrail is obviously very important and uh, you know the type of guardrail we'll, we'll start with these beginning ones and uh, do beware i i switched to my uh, floor plan view and uh, so when i drew this i accidentally chose my new construction floor plan so any object i created in this case a guardrail is new construction. So I, I wanna make sure that I put it on the existing phase here, and uh, then it will show up correctly in my other views. And kind of an inauspicious beginning here, it doesn't really look like much, uh, but let's go to our railing samples drawing. And if you remember, uh, these are railings that we can actually just copy and paste into our project. Uh, there's any number of different ones, but uh, let's grab this one. This one is actually as probably pretty close to what we've got. Just copy and paste it into your project to load this railing family in. And uh, when you do that, be aware you'll, you'll get a, a message that says, oh, you, you've already got some of this stuff in here. Um, these are standard uh, Revit families that um, are, are kind of the part of the nested component. Anyway, when you finally finish placing it in there in your model, uh, you can actually delete that copy. We don't need it anymore. But let's go up to our railing here on the third floor and uh, we can select it and change its properties to that new railing. Uh, like we did before, to tweak this object to be a family that's close to what we, closer to what we have in the project, uh, we do have to go and edit the type to see what exactly is inside this family. And I'm gonna duplicate this family uh, just so um, it, it, it's, I don't mess up the original in case I want to go back to it. Uh, so I'll just write, I'll give it a name, existing. But then let's take a look at the structure. And I'm going to preview it here so you can see what the changes look like. Uh, there are actually 3D views. You can, you can look at each. The reason I like to do this is as you look at the structure, you can see them. And uh, we have done this before. We can edit the rail structure and we can, we can remove or add pieces as needed. In this case, these two railings, um, we actually don't need them. So they're not in our project. So we can delete them and there you go. And you can see that the glass panels will grow uh, proportionately. Now uh, with railings, one of the funky things about the way they work, so many funky things is you can't paint them directly. And in this case, we not only do we want to paint them, we want to change the dimension of this top rail. Uh, and to do to paint these, you actually have to go and find the rail family. So in this case, here's my uh, top rail. I'm going to modify that so that it is a different dimension. Right now it's two by two, like we've done with uh, the mullions on the exterior of the building, we can duplicate this and uh, make it uh, one by four, I believe is the dimension. 
Finally, we have to note the profile of this handrail. Remember, changing the name doesn't change the profile. So we need to figure out how to edit this rectangular handrail two by two um, in order to change the shape of this, of this railing. And you might say, isn't it here under all these other balusters and railings, handrail types? Well, no, because it's made of a profile. So this is why these menus are so, uh, these railings are so complicated. We actually have to change the profile, which is in a different subgrouping. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was called rectangular handrail, two by two. And uh, like we did with the mullions, we're gonna go and let's get the type properties and see what we're looking at. Duplicate this guy and we'll call it, uh, you know, one by four and uh, let's change the dimensions. Again, changing the name doesn't change the dimensions. The height, I actually think it's it's a lot smaller. I think it's about a half an inch um, by, by four inches. I'm not going to change the name. Um, and like uh, with other types of objects, there's, there's other information, but that, that should do it. Now we just have to go back to the main menu, the uh, family type for this railing. Choose edit type. Uh, go over here, we have our top rail, one quarter of an inch, uh, where it has the, um, we edit that, and then we can come in and <laughs> choose the new handrail profile that we created. Apply, and OK, and apply, and OK, and there you go, you have yourself a handrail. The last thing we can do to touch up this railing, now that we've got the panels kind of right and the top railing, is uh, just the heights, and I believe there actually is a bottom rail in here. Make sure that everything is following the correct clearances for uh, what's required by your code and, of course, what's in our project. So back in the family type, we can change a number of things, and all these default uh, families have a lot of things like offsets that you need to be aware of. Uh, basically, that's does the baluster or railing occur inboard or outboard of the placement line. I'm going to make these uh, zero uh, because <laughs> there aren't any offsets in our particular project. Um, and a guardrail should be at least uh, 39 or, or no, 42 inches high. So let's make this 42 inches. And Finally, we can come in and choose the rail structure. I believe we removed all the railings, uh, the rails, but I, I forgot that there is a bottom rail. So I'm going to insert a bottom rail, and uh, it, its height should be at least four inches off the ground, no greater than six, so that a sphere passing through it doesn't cause any problems. And I created a new profile for myself, a rectangular handrail. Um, that uh, is going to match the top, but be a little narrower. Finally, choose a material for the handrail that's going to match everything else. Uh, I have a handrail material that I created. Now, back here in the baluster placement menu, uh, you do want to make sure that the spacing for the top and the bottom works correctly. The baluster, the glass panel baluster that uh, we've been using, uh, you can specify the top and bottom of that based on either the host, which is the attach, uh, where the drawing of your, uh, the sketch of your original railing is, um, or you can base it off of this new railing you just created. You can say, oh, I only want it to be two inches uh, above that railing. Um, same with the top of the panel. These are all parametric, so you can tell it, oh, give me the top of the panel, but maybe offset it a tiny bit. Finally, uh, just make sure that every element of your project is getting painted correctly, like we did before. If you have some baluster, here I'll click on the start post, see how it highlights it here. Uh, if it's not painted correctly, go and find that family somewhere in your project browser. You'll find that family and uh, you can make sure that the materials are applied correctly. Um, and for some materials, and, and this is kind of the quixotic thing about uh, Revit, um, like the top rail, the material is applied here in the main menu. You can kind of click through, uh, probably because it's a profile rather than a standalone family, but go figure, that's just, that's just the way it's done. 
And there you go, you have created a pretty convincing existing uh, staircase with an existing railing. You might say, well, but isn't it occurring on other floors? It absolutely is. You can select this object, do control C to copy, but then in the modify toolbar, you'll see under the paste option, there's actually another option hidden under here, the aligned to selected levels. And I can copy this down to the other level. I don't need it up on the roof, and I already am on level three. I'll click OK, and like magic, it shows up down on the floor below. So as you can see, you can create a model of an existing building, uh, even with some pretty complex elements uh, quite quickly. Obviously, tweaking the model is going to require a lot more advanced Revit knowledge, but uh, this allows you to get the basic idea of a building uh, quite easily and relatively quickly.